Father, uh, we do thank you that you speak to us through your word. We thank you too that you sent your Holy Spirit, the spirit of truth, to write your word on our hearts. And so we pray that uh, you would speak to us today, Holy Spirit, so that we can know Jesus and in knowing him have life in his name. And we ask this for your name's sake. Amen. What are some of the big questions? Oh, yeah, sorry, Andy is telling me uh, before I start that um, there are kids' packs up the back if any children would like them. Uh, so you're welcome to make use of those. Okay, let's get underway. Um, what are some of the big questions that you have about the Christian faith? Uh, maybe you have intellectual questions, say, I know about trying to understand the Trinity or maybe God's sovereignty and human responsibility. Maybe you have more personal or experiential questions like maybe about suffering or, or prayer or how to overcome sin or maybe even if God loves you. Maybe you're exploring Christianity and you've got questions not just about what Christianity is, what we believe, but how do you know that it's true? Actually, that's not just a question for those exploring faith. It's also a question for believers. When I was in my 20s, that was my question. I'd grown up as a Christian. My parents were missionaries. I'd been taught the Bible since I was a kid. But at university, I was asking all sorts of questions about my faith. And one of the big ones was, how can I know that Christianity is true? The Bible says all sorts of amazing things about Jesus, that he's God come in the flesh, that he died for our sins, that he rose again, he ascended into heaven, he's coming back as judge to, to fix this world, to make all things new. How could I know it was true? That question was one of the reasons I ended up doing a theology degree because I, I just wanted answers. Well, this is our final sermon on 1 John. It's a letter written by the Apostle John at the end of his life, and it's not so much uh, a letter really as a sermon or maybe even a primer on the Christian faith. John writes to tell his first readers and us what are the essentials of Christianity so that we won't get led astray by false teaching and so that we can know we're Christians. He wants us to know God's love and to have confidence in our faith. In verse 13 of uh, chapter 5, uh, he writes this, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. Last week, Al suggested uh, that the letter is a little bit like a croissant. Um, I'm not really going to push that analogy, uh, but John certainly does circle around his main themes and the letter is delicious. Uh, this is what John says it is to be a Christian, to believe in the name of God's son, Jesus Christ, and to love one another. That's our response to the God who is love and who has loved us by sending his son, Jesus, to die for us. And so in this final chapter, John circles back to these themes again. And he answers that question about how we can know all this stuff about Jesus is true. But he begins the chapter by looking at faith in action. So we're going to do that together, um, having a look at verse 1. you can I'll try and pop up some verses on the screen, but if you've got a Bible on your phone or there's some up the back, you're welcome to make use of those. So verse 1, he writes, Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God, and everyone who loves the Father loves his child as well. This is how we know that we love the children of God, by loving God and carrying out his commands. In fact, this is love for God, to keep his commands, and his commands are not burdensome. Jesus said that the entire Old Testament can be summed up in these two commands, love God and love your neighbour. 
And here John fleshes that out a little. How do you love God? By believing in his son, Jesus. If you love the father, you'll love his son as well. That love for the son flows seamlessly into love for brothers and his brothers and sisters, the church. And John, as he always does, reflects Jesus' own teaching. This is how you love God. You obey his commands. And his commands are this, to love one another. Now, anyone who's ever tried to put this command into practice uh, knows that it at times can be quite difficult. I mean, quite frankly, other people are just so annoying. They do all sorts of things I just don't like. They place so many demands upon me. They take so much time. They're so hard to understand. And if I'm honest, I'm more than just a little bit selfish. But John continues with this incredible statement. His commands are not burdensome. What? Not burdensome? How? Well, he goes on. For everyone is born of God. Everyone born of God overcomes the world. This is the victory that has overcome the world, even our faith. Who is it that overcomes the world? Only the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. Okay, how on earth does that answer that question? <laughs> what does John mean by this? Well, some Christians talk about living in victory. Uh, I'm not sure whether that's quite what John has in mind here, but the victory he does have in mind is overcoming the world. And what he means by that is humanity set against God and his ways. You know, it's just so easy, isn't it, to go along with the crowd, to not love God, to, to not obey his commands, and especially the ones that are unfashionable. It's so easy not to love one another, but just to be selfish. So how do we overcome that? Well, John says we believe that Jesus is the Son of God. That is to say, Actually, Jesus is the only one who's perfectly resisted the world, the flesh, and the devil. He's the one who prayed in Gethsemane to his father, not my will, but yours be done. And his obedience, out of his love for his father, that obedience even to death was the great victory over the world and its prince. What's more, Jesus' victory is also the great demonstration of his love for us. That love moves us to love in return. Our hearts are melted by his love so that, my goodness, we manage to actually love one another. You know, it's not that our faith is victorious. It's that we have faith in the one who is victorious, as we trust him, so we participate in his victory over the world by the power of the Holy Spirit, whom he's, he's given us, who moves us to love God and to live the life of love that God calls us to, for which we're made. And so we also share in Jesus' garden prayer, it's there in that prayer that Jesus taught us to pray every day. When we're confronted with the world, the flesh, we pray, our Father, hallowed be your name. Your will be done on earth, even in my life, here and now. But how do we know that Jesus really is the Son of God, come into the world to die for our sins? If this prayer of faith, uh, if this is a prayer of faith to share in his victory, upon what basis do we place our faith? Well, at the start of the letter, Jesus, uh, John said that he himself saw and heard and touched Jesus. We proclaim what we have seen and heard, John writes. The Christian faith has, from the very start, been based upon the eyewitness testimony of the apostles. 
and that's recorded for us in the pages of the New Testament. As Christians, we believe that the Bible is God's word because, well, actually it tells us that it is. But that kind of raises a bit of a question. Why should I trust the Bible? And the standard answer I heard when I was asking these questions in my 20s was, because the Bible's historically reliable. Now, I'm convinced that uh, that is absolutely true. It's a true statement. And if you're interested, uh, I've got some books I can recommend um, for you to follow up. Uh, but the historical reliability of the Bible is actually a little bit complicated. And most of us have neither the time nor the training to really come to grips with all the historical complexities uh, that lie in that answer. And as I pursued that question of how can I know, I came across a theological problem with uh, the answer because the Bible's historically reliable. And the problem is this. If I have as the basis for my faith the historical reliability of the Bible, then my faith is not actually in God at that point, but in people and in their research, their arguments. It's not to say that it isn't reliable, but if that's the place where I put all my eggs, as it were, then actually it's not in God, but it's in people's arguments. And this would make God dependent upon us as humans, which is a contradiction. We're dependent upon God, not he upon us. Or to put it in reverse, if God were dependent upon us, then he wouldn't be God. And the 19th century atheist Ludwig Feuerbach's critique of Christianity would be right that we just make God in our own image. Well, I could have read one John because... Uh, he raises this question in a positive form in verse 9. We accept human testimony, John writes, but God's testimony is greater because it is, because it is the testimony of God which is given about his son. So where do we find God's testimony about his son? What John tells us in verses 6 to 12. He writes, this is the one who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ. He did not come by water only, but by water and blood. And it is the Spirit who testifies because the Spirit is the truth. For there are three that testify, the Spirit, the water, and the blood, and they are in agreement. Now, uh, I have to say, uh, these are the most difficult verses in 1 John to understand, <laughs> and commentators both ancient and modern are divided as to what they mean. So uh, I'm going to give you what I think is the best reading of this. When John says that Jesus came by water and blood, he's referring firstly to Jesus' baptism and crucifixion. In John's gospel, Jesus' baptism and crucifixion are moments where Jesus' identity is revealed with God the Father himself testifying to this. And you can read about that in John 1 and John 12. But I'm convinced that John has a secondary present meaning in mind when he speaks about the testimony of the water and the blood, and that is to the sacraments baptism and the Lord's Supper. In Romans chapter 6, we read that in baptism, we are united to Jesus. We participate in his death and resurrection. Jesus identified himself with sinful humanity in his baptism. And in our baptism, we are united to him as the redeemer of our humanity. And in 1 Corinthians 10, we read that the cup of thanksgiving is oh, literally the Eucharist in Greek, is a participation in the blood of Christ. As Jesus' baptism and death were God's testimony to his son, so as we receive baptism and the cup of the Lord, they are God's testimony to us in our present experience. 
I find the Anglican Catechism really helpful at this point when it describes the sacraments as an outward visible sign of an inward spiritual grace given to us by God, ordained by Christ himself, as the means by which, as a means by which we receive that grace, as a tangible assurance that we do in fact receive it. That is to say, that Jesus' blood washes me clean from my sin, so that I'm a forgiven child of God, is as real as the water that was poured on my head when I was baptized. And so I don't forget, and to remind me of his forgiveness that Jesus, the God, the Son incarnate, died for me. Well, that is as real as the bread I eat and the wine I drink. The water and the blood, baptism and communion, are the outward visible testimony of the Father to me. And this is accompanied by a third, the inward testimony of the Holy Spirit. Now, that is not to answer all our questions about knowing God. I mean, by no means. I, I don't expect we could ever come to the end of questions for the infinite God. But in the sacraments and the inner testimony of the Holy Spirit, I can place my faith not in human testimony, but ultimately in the testimony of God to me. What's more... The sacraments are a testimony that is accessible to all, regardless of age, ability, reading level, or access to the Bible in their own language. And what is God's testimony? Well, John tells us in verse 11, this is the testimony. God has given us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. Whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have the Son of God does not have life. So for those of you who are, are believers, you're Christians, you're wondering, does God love me? Maybe you're not sure if he can forgive you, your burden by guilt, your failures. Come to his table. Jesus himself has given the bread and the wine to assure you of his love and forgiveness of you and your sins. I know some of you struggle with intrusive thoughts that make it difficult for you to come to the table. Well, take heart. He has overcome the world and the devil. It is not your faith that is victorious. It's your faith in the one who is victorious. You wouldn't say, I'm sick, so I can't take medicine. No, our weakness and frailty is all the more reason to come and to be nourished at his table. And for those of you who are here today and maybe you don't know whether you're a Christian or you're not sure, you, you know, maybe you know you're not a Christian, but you're here exploring or hear God's word to you today. God has given us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. Whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have the Son of God does not have life. Do you have the Son? Oh, yes, being a Christian is all about living a life of love, but that comes from the life of the sun flowing through us. Without the sun, we don't have life. So will you receive the sun today? We have a prayer of confession coming up in our service. Make this a moment when you say sorry to God for living your own way. Ask for his forgiveness and commit to living a life believing Jesus is the Christ, God's king, your king, and then you are welcome to come to the table and receive those tokens of God's love for you. 
Okay, three brief points in the final verses of 1 John. First, John invites us to that most basic of Christian practice and our greatest privilege, prayer. Verse 14, he writes, This is the confidence we have in approaching God, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have what we've asked of him. Through Jesus, we have confidence to approach the creator of the universe as our father. And the closer we come to Jesus, the more our prayers will line up with God's will. So come to Jesus and come to prayer. And did you notice what John immediately says to pray for? The brother or sister who sins, that God will lead them to the way of life. As Christians, we are called to pray for each other. It is the easiest and the most powerful thing that we can do to love one another. So are you praying for your brothers and sisters here at St. George's, those that you know and love? And not just for things like their health concerns, but also for their godliness, for their growth in faith and obedience. You know what? I, I know I certainly need those prayers, and I imagine each of you does too. Well, second... Verses 18 to 20, John talks about protection. He knows this world is not a safe place. We all face spiritual danger. In verse 19, he writes, we know the whole world is under the control of the evil one. But John also wants us to know this. We are the children of God. And Jesus keeps us safe. And the evil one cannot do us harm. That is not to say we won't face sickness or suffering or temptation, even death. But our lives are hidden in Christ. We're safe in him. Nothing can separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Some years ago, Claire's aunt Faye died, and she happened to know Colin Buchanan, uh, great Australian uh, Christian kids uh, bard, you might say, song, uh, songman. Um, anyway, he has lots of songs. My kids love it. He sang this song at her funeral. Be strong and courageous, the Lord of the ages, holds all his little ones safe by his side. We need not fear anything in this world because Jesus has conquered them all and in him we are safe. Well, John's final word uh, is a bit of uh, an abrupt ending to the letter. Dear children, keep yourselves from idols. There it is. In his day, these were physical uh, representations of false gods but actually, every age, in every age, we are tempted to worship counterfeit gods. Tim Keller defines an idol as anything more important to you than God, anything that absorbs your, your heart and imagination more than God, anything you seek to give you what only God can give. That might be money or pleasure, relationships, career, intellect, music, sex, video games, anything that competes with God for our affection and our allegiance. So how do we keep ourselves from idols? Well, we come again to Jesus. In him we find that we are infinitely loved, unshakably secure, eternally safe. So why don't we pray? Our Father, thank you uh, for this Delicious croissant, this rich gem in your word, John's first letter. We thank you for 
his depth and clarity. So simple that you're the God who loves us. Your love in yourself, you've shown your love in sending Jesus to die for us. And so you call us to respond to you, to believe in your son, so have life in his name and to love one another even as you love us. So Holy Spirit, write these truths in our hearts. Help us to know your love and move us to live the life of love you call us to. We ask this for our good, for the blessing of our neighbours, the glory of your holy name. Amen.